All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to our Neighborhood Gardening series. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. My name is David Bryant uh, from the California Native Plant Society. And tonight's topic is really, really special. I'm really excited. We talk about the power of habitat when it comes to native plants in virtually all of our webinars. And we'll definitely be talking about that tonight. Um, but we're gonna go above and beyond this evening in talking about the ways you can maximize uh, habitat in your backyard, in your gardens, in your living spaces. Um, so of course, native plants are, are fundamental to that, but there's also some philosophies and approaches and techniques that we can employ and implement to make our gardens even friendlier to wildlife uh, and really forge that connection. So we're, we're really jazzed uh, to have you here and, and have an expert group of panelists to uh, discuss that from a number of angles. All right, so we can go to the next slide, Maya. Okay, beautiful. So we have two segments tonight. The first segment is going to be uh, some mini presentations by our panelists. And as I mentioned, we have a great group lined up. We have Tora Rocha from the Pollinator Posse. We have Tony Tubbs, a, a biology teacher and a CNPS garden ambassador. He founded the native uh, plant garden at the high school there and takes these gorgeous uh, uh, wildlife photos, which we selfishly use uh, on the CNPS social media site a lot. So you've probably seen them. And we're also honored to have John Roden, who is the Senior Director of Bird Friendly Communities at the National Audubon Society. So uh, each one of these panelists will be uh, presenting uh, for a brief kind of lightning presentation about their experiences and perspectives habitat uh, gardening. And uh, then we will turn to segment two. And segment two is a panel discussion uh, where the horticulture team and I uh, here at CNPS get the chance to ask this great group of panelists some questions about habitat gardening with native plants and, and what are some of the ways, again, philosophically, uh, technically, what are some of the uh, techniques we can employ to really make our backyards, our gardens, and our patios, all these living spaces, uh, more welcoming and friendly to the wildlife in our communities. All right, so we're, we'll, we're close to um, turning the floor over to our panelists. Uh, but before we do, I just wanted to preface uh, the conversations we'll be having tonight with a few great pointers. Um, and I'll let the Hort team jump in here, here too. The, the, the first bullet I'll, I'll speak to, you know, California is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, what exactly that means? Well, it's a place on earth that is incredibly rich in species, in flora, in fauna. There are so many different types of birds, bees, butterflies, and tons and tons of native plants. So we have over 6,000 species here, and so many different relationships are built uh, from our wildlife around those native plants. So uh, it's really great to live in a biodiversity hotspot. What that also comes with is the fact that these hotspots have acute environmental challenges. So uh, climate change, uh, urban development, uh, lots of different factors that, that are pressing issues that the biodiversity there faces. And California is certainly no different. So habitat gardening is just a really great way that, that we as individuals um, can make, our, uh, make a difference in our yards and gardens. So um, hi, Anne-Marie and Maya. Uh, there are fabulous horticulture engagement staff. Do you guys want to speak to these other points here? Well, hi, I'm Anne-Marie. I'm the horticulture programs manager. And Maya is here as well as our horticulture programs coordinator. I heard a great quote from a wise person the other day that said, biodiversity is biosecurity. And California native plants have co-evolved with so many different flora, you know, fauna, all the, the integral parts of this biodiversity, they've all co-evolved together to give us a really unique, beautiful space in California. And putting native plants back into our built environment helps to support all of that. Beautiful. Yeah. Just to add on, yeah, I mean, just with my own personal experience, um, working for the Forest Service, doing pollination ecology field work, like uh, observing these pollinators in you know the Sierras and within the foothills of the Sierras, we would do native plant surveys along with surveying for these bumblebees and hummingbirds and other pollinators. Like they're so linked and tied together, you can't have one without the other. And it's really important to, you know, highlight the 
biodiversity in our native plants, which are truly the foundation of all native ecosystems um, in California and beyond. And I think having gardens, I mean, in California especially, like I think it's at least 50% of the state is developed. So it's really important to have these wildlife corridors and these bridges between the built landscape and the undeveloped parts of our state um, combined and you know create that habitat for um, all the critters that we have in our state. So yeah. really important work. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank, thank you both. And now we'll turn it over to our uh, panelists. And I'd first like to introduce Tora Roach um, from the Pollinator Posse. So hi, Tora. Hi, David. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am Tora Rocha. Um, I used to be the park supervisor for the city of Oakland. I worked for in the parks for 37 years, um, and now I'm retired and do the Pollinator Posse full time. This was a bee hotel that um, I call the Airbnb because we had Airbnb employees working with us um, in the garden um, that I built when I realized that we, the way we maintain parks and public spaces, um, we're removing the habitat for our native bees by removing the dead wood. And I realized I had to change my ways and teach my staff and our volunteers to change their ways to create more habitat in our parks and not just make everything safe for humans. This was the way I gave back um, and reaching out and making an effort. Um, I won best of the Bay that year. So it was nice to see that people appreciate when we are doing things to help our local wildlife. Next, next slide, please. Um, people talk about how sometimes that California native plantings are not so pretty. I think this is really beautiful. Um, what I wanted to say in pollinator habitat, it's really important that you have not just plants, but structures. It's really important to have a water feature if you want to attract pollinators. Um, and also um, we put these cobblestones and this is at the gardens at Lake Merritt in Oakland. Um, this is a California native pollinator garden um, to have mass plantings of different things. The cobbles are there for the native bees to nest. They like to nest in the ground, but this protects the ground from getting tilled or pulled. Um, also salamanders and beetles, and there's so much that just can live in this habitat. But slow moving water source is so critical if you want habitat. It's not just about planting the plants, it's creating the whole system. Ceanothus, everyone knows, is a great pollinator plant. This is a painted lady nectaring on Ceanothus, um, having not just nectar sources for butterflies, but having host plants. Host plants are the plants that um, butterflies lay their eggs on. Um, so learning the whole life cycle of butterflies is critical if you want to have butterflies in your yard. You can't just plant just for the adult of the life cycle. You have to also plant for the larva. Um, also knowing the whole life cycle is so important. Um, a lot of the nectar plants for butterflies are crossover for bees. So plant a lot of nectar and a lot of um, host plants combined that will attract pollinators. This is buckwheats. That's my go-to plant for pollinators. 24 different Lepidoptera in California use this as a host plant. So the more buckwheat you put in, please, please, please. This is one of my favorites. Um, that's a little gray hair streak. Um, I'm sorry, I'm rushing through all of this, but it's, um, there's a little native bee on a Clarkia. Um, wildflowers, don't just plant perennials. Don't forget the wildflowers, the annual flowers. Um, different like Pacific Code Seed and Hedgerow Farms has great pollinator mixes that they've worked with Xerce Society to create. So it's an easy go-to. Um, also, this is Facilia, another one of my absolute go-to plants for bees. This is a little native bee. And most people don't know that there, how many native bees in California, Anne-Marie? There are 1600 native bees. Most people don't know that. And um, so they only focus on the honeybee, but we really, really need to focus on the critical um, native bees in our state. Um, there's research that says even on farms that native bees produce 
can um, help your farm get 25% higher yields on your crops because they don't take the pollen back necessarily to the hive to feed their babies like honeybees. They actually just kind of belly flop from flower to flower. So they're actually better pollinators. So um, being aware of how they nest is important. Um, there's 70% of them are ground nesters. So please don't use weed cloth, use cardboard for sheet mulching instead. Um, and then leave some dead wood. I tell people, you know, everyone's removing logs and trees for fire. If you have a dead log or dead tree, cut it chest high, drill holes about um, three eighths inch holes on the north side. And then you have your own bee hotel. Just, you know, there's easy ways to, to co compromise with our native species. Um, these are some of my favorite pollinator um, plants. There's a million of them. There's um, the one up in the right hand upper corner is absolute a must have. That's a Rigeron Wayne Roderick. Um, if you look, there's three different pollinators right there in front of you. A leaf cutter bee and two fiery skippers. Um, you plant this plant, you will have nectar for everybody. Um, the lower right, everyone knows the California poppy. You just can't have enough poppies. The bees are just incredibly drawn to poppies. That's a little native bee in there. Um, on the upper left is Facilia again. Bumblebees just go nuts for Facilias. Um, don't forget to plant both annual and perennial Facilias. And then on the bottom is of course milkweed, our um, native California narrow leaf milkweed on the left-hand corner on the bottom. And even people only think about milkweed for um, monarchs, but actually if you make, if you have a lot of milkweed, it'll survive, it'll nectar, be nectar source for all of your pollinators in your garden. They all love it. Next. What's important, super important. Here's a few, um, people don't realize how many California na um, native milkweeds there are. This is a list of all of the California milkweeds. Um, I don't want to get too much into milkweeds. It's it's a must have, you have to start planting more of it right now for the monarchs because the numbers are so bad. Um, there's a, they only had 1900 total in the overwintering sites for all of California this year, got down from 30,000. So please plant milkweed. Um, the important thing about buying native plants more than any other thing I can stress today, please, is to make sure they are pesticide free and make sure you are harassing your, your nurseries to only provide ne non-neonic sprayed native plants because that's the tragedy out there right now is um, buy from your local native plant nurseries. Please stay away from the box until we can get them the box stores to stop. Um, pesticides are definitely doing the biggest damage and habitat loss, those are the two things. Um, so please, that's my big thing plant more native plants, especially at least 75%, even if you're in an urban garden. And if you're in an, um, a garden in your yard is near open space, please don't plant anything that can become a noxious weed that recedes heavily that's not native. Um, that's, you know, can be a tragedy too, but there's easy ways to correct, to, you know, help the um, maximize habitat in your yard, planting natives, but don't forget the water the water source, the dead wood, um, rocks, you need that whole habitat. So um, thank you and thank you for inviting me. You can reach me at pollinatorposse.org. If you have emails, you can email me there. Um, and if you wanna get involved, we're always looking for volunteers to help um, plant more habitat. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tora, thank you so much. And we'll be, we'll be asking you some questions in this panel discussion coming up, so. Thank you very much. And now we'll introduce Tony Tubbs. Uh, Tony, again, is our uh, one of our CNPS Garden Ambassadors and founder of the Native Garden at the Tesoro uh, High School campus. So welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to this webinar. I'm excited. Um, I want to share the story real quick about Tesoro High School and how all we're doing around here came about. So we are in, a, in an incredible valley. Um, in Southern California, Chibuco Canyon area, Orange County. And we're surrounded by coastal sage scrub, but 
on the top, maybe two thirds of the hillsides around us. And then off in the distance, we can see Majeska and San Diego Peak, Saddleback Mountain. Um, there you go, there's a picture there. But below that great coastal sage scrub, there's probably anywhere from, from our boundary of the school all the way back to 300 feet, it's weeds. It's weeds and non-natives. And when they built the school, that was the backfill area. So what we're trying to do is we're literally going out to our boundary line, the Capistrano Unified School District boundary line, and we're restoring that area. So it started about, about 10 years ago, I had a class, Natural History of California and Biology. I taught both. So we would go out all the time and study the plants and animals, the wildlife. But we would talk about biodiversity and there was nothing on our property that was very biodiverse because it was just, it was weeds. So we thought, hey, let's restore this and really make a difference. One plant at a time, one garden at a time, let's bring back nature. So we started, unfortunately, when we really started about six years ago, I lost that class. Hopefully I'll, I'll get something similar back someday. So right now it's just my biology students. I shouldn't say just my biology students. Um, we'll go out and we'll have a planting effort and we'll plant from 45 to 80 plants. Um, Tree of Life Nursery, we're real fortunate. They're right a stone's throw away down Ortega Highway. Um, I think they're the largest native plant nursery in California, if I'm not mistaken, but they do a great job helping us out there with advice and whatnot. But uh, biology students get involved, our, our, our ecology club students. We have scouts that come in and help out, uh, volunteer groups like Lion's Heart and parents and feeder school students. So hopefully my, my story today, you know, in, inspires some others in the same situation to uh, try the same thing. But uh, we do a lot of mass plantings of some of the diehard natives that we have around here. And we are noticing a difference in nature. We have more bees, we have more butterflies, we have more hummingbirds. There's a greater, greater variety of birds around the school. Uh, a lot of the pictures, if you um, go to, to Soro underscore tubs, you'll see some of the nature photos there of the wildlife around our school. Um, we also have some trail cameras uh, set up and we get evidence of uh, the bobcats like you see behind me here. Uh, sorry, my lights just turned off. And uh, coyotes, mule deer, skunks, spotted and striped. We get snakes, uh, owls, hawks on these wildlife cameras. So the only thing we haven't gotten on our wildlife camera is a mountain lion uh, yet, but they're in the area. <laughs> they're certainly in the area. So um, we're really making a difference. We're about five, six years into this. And like I said, we're transforming that area that was just weeds and non-native plants surrounding our school. We're transforming that and bringing back nature with uh, California native plants. So it's exciting. And uh, we still have, a, a, we still have uh, some work to do, but uh, if you're in Southern Cal California, please uh, look us up and contact me uh, through the school or the, the Instagram account and uh, we'll have you out here and we'll put you to work. You can help us out. <laughs> Beautiful, do you wanna talk? We have some of your gorgeous uh, nature photography here, uh, Tony, from, from the garden. Do you wanna talk a little bit about the Thanks. species here? Yeah, I mean, like we said, we get all sorts of uh, hummingbirds. We do have a couple ponds. So scouts are involved with helping us out too. We probably have, so if you're in this situation, reach out to scouts. We have. 30 plus Eagle Scout projects, uh, two of them have built ponds. Okay, so they're seasonal ponds. They just fill up, you know, during the winter and then they dry up, you know, through summer and they bring in, you know, the dragonflies. Um, I've seen a couple coach whips and garter snakes, you know, cooling themselves off in the pond. Um, uh, that's exciting when you, when you see a snake. Uh, we have a lot of rattlesnakes around the school. So obviously we have to be careful, but um, they're coming in, uh, into the habitat. Uh, we get coyotes all the time. We get coyote evidence tracks and, and scat and certainly uh, on camera, uh, a whole variety of, we get king snakes, gopher snakes as well, um, various lizards. 
Um, so just the host, it's the ecology unit is really fun to teach. We're out there all the time um, investigating the plants and the animals and the interaction and setting up research projects. So it's really good for the, the students and the learning environment. Um, it's amazing. We're certainly taking advantage of all the nature that's surrounding our school now. Beautiful. Yeah, I love seeing all the different birds and, and butterflies and other critters that you capture uh, in your garden on social media. Allen's hummingbirds, sorry, sorry interject. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Allens and Annas and, and Costas, uh, Rufus, the hummingbirds. Uh, we get monarchs. Oh, we get the coastal California gnat catcher. Um, we've had those probably the last four years or so habitually come into. We have the blue gray gnat catcher, but also the, the, um, the threatened, the protected coastal California gnat catcher. Uh, monarchs. We've got some milkweed that crops up every year. The, um, the, the um, showy or Mojave milkweed, uh, or the woolly pod milkweed, excuse me, the woolly pod milkweed comes up every year and the monarchs love it. You just saw a picture of a caterpillar, monarch caterpillar. So uh, build it and they will come. <laughs> Plant the plants and, and uh, the nature, nature certainly follows, wildlife certainly follows. Beautiful. I see you have a Tecate cypress, it looks like, in the in the foreground there. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Um, we try to stick with the, the diehards around here um, in the mass plantings. But, you know, every now and then, because you don't see too many Tecate, you know, surrounding us on these foothills. But every now and then, you know, we'll, we'll plant a Tory pine or a Tecate cypress or a juniper or something like that. And, and we still, with care, um, get them to thrive, to grow. And that's exciting too, to bring in some of those that are in the fringe habitats around us. Yeah, really cool. There you see, that's behind our school. That's what we call our nature trail area. We had a scout build a stage, a separate scout built those benches. So we have a trail that goes around this area. It's about an acre and a half or so. Those are some newly, literally newly planted plants. That was a scout project. Those plants you see there with the, the basins. Uh, that was a scout who planted, he and his troop planted 60 plants. Um, they're thriving uh, now. We have a super, super high success rate here with plants. Most of our, if we do a mass planting of 60, 70 plants, we'll get 85, 90% of them to survive. Wow. Um, some of the things we're battling are critters mainly, right? There's, there's gophers, there's squirrels, there's rabbits, there's, uh, but we have a pretty high success rate. Um, so the kids are doing a great job, the kids and the volunteers uh, planting the plants. Some someone of our asked trails about, system. oh, sorry, not to interrupt, but someone I took asked my glasses about, off. Oh, great. Uh, someone asked about irrigation. It looks like in this picture, do you just use hose and just deeply water for establishment? Or we do. Yeah, that's what it looks we like. We do use a hose. I have about 600 feet of hose that can reach from one from our spigot to the far corner of this nature trail. So, you know, we, um, oh, you know, there's a great video. It's, if you go to that Instagram, I'll say it again. I could, you know, put it in the chat a little bit later. It's, it's Tesoro all small letters to Soro underscore tubs. And it has a link to an interview I did with Mike Evans, one of the owners of Tree of Life Nursery. And it kind of explains all the gardens and it takes you through a little tour, but we do hand water. And you know, we, it depends on the time of year, of course, if we have a wet winter and we get substantial rain, we water much less, but we've even planted in April. Now think about this in April, and without water, May, June, July, August, September, October, hose once a week, we start off watering once a week, fill up that basin. And then after, you know, we see how they're doing after about two, two and a half, three months, we could stretch it to once every couple of weeks and go a month or two after four or five months. Most of these plants are just good on their own and we do not water them and they thrive. So 
Mm -hmm. We just fill them up with the hose and, and that's our system. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tony. We're gonna to go um, on to John now and, and thanks for sharing. Thank you. Awesome, awesome garden. Um, and so again, John uh, is from the National Audubon Society and is the Senior Director of Bird Friendly Communities there. So welcome, John. And we're gonna actually go ahead and turn our, turn our screen off and let John uh, share his PowerPoint. So um, yeah, sorry, welcome, John. <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm gonna go ahead and share. Can you see that? Yes, beautiful. Great, oh shoot. Um, so thanks, um, it's, it's great to be here. I'm very used to talking to bird audiences. So it's great to talk to um, an audience that comes into this space a little more through the, with the lens of native plants. Um, I do, uh, so as David mentioned, I oversee um, uh, our bird friendly community strategy at the National Audubon Society. And I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to this group about um, as we're thinking about habitat that we're creating, how we're doing that to support birds in, in myriad ways. Um, before I get to that, I wanted to just, uh, I'm not sure if people are super familiar with Audubon, you may be, but I just wanted to give you just a very quick snapshot of, of who we are and where we are. So we're, you know, over a hundred years old at this point, we have this national reach that focuses on our chapters and centers and state offices, important bird areas. And we have um, close to 2 million members across the country. So we have quite a large um, reach and I get to work with across this entire network, which is a blessing. Um, I, um, I do oversee our bird friendly communities conservation strategy at Audubon and, and our guiding principle is trying to meet birds needs in the communities we share with them. Um, and on my team, we really believe that by making our communities better for birds, we're also making them better for people. And that's really one of our grounding um, and overriding principles that we think about. But if, just to drill down into it a little bit, if we're thinking about how do we make our communities more friendly for birds, we think about providing them with the things they need. So principally, we focus on food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise their young. And with the understanding and realization that if we can do that effectively, we are making our communities more friendly for birds um, and for people. So um, I did wanna just have a quick note on this particular photo. This is a female hooded oriole that's collecting nesting material off a California fan palm. This was taken here in California. And this was actually the winning photograph in the Audubon Photo Awards Plants for Birds category in 2019. So we, I wanted to share that be, as was the first photo, um, was not the winner, but the first photo of the Western Tanager and the Blue Palo Verde was also from our photo awards in that category. We're currently in the middle of our submission period for this year's Audubon Photo Awards. And it, I just thought it would be useful to raise with this audience. If you're phot photographers like Tony, right, who are taking pictures of plants and birds together, um, feel free to submit and you can find out how to do that on audubon.org. I'm always looking for new um, photos and there's just obviously some real talent out there. Um, so there's a shameless plug. Uh, so, but thinking about how we actually create habitat um, for birds specifically um, in the spaces we care for them. I, I apologize for using this photo which was actually taken in Nebraska but I do just love the profusion of beauty. And as Tora mentioned, you know, sometimes we get pushed back, well, native plants aren't that beautiful. And I will disagree strongly with that. And this is, you know, just one example of that. Um, I, again, don't need to preach to this audience about the utility of planting native plants um, and what they provide for birds is of course, resources directly and indirectly through the insects they host, which are critical for the life cycle of um, pretty much all of our bird species, even if they aren't insectivorous as adults, they feed the, those um, principally caterpillars, but um, other insects to their young, which help them thrive and, and fledge. So that connection is very clear and I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on it. And so I'm not going to, but um, it's, it's really critical that we get more native plants in the ground to support our native bird species. Okay, so thinking about again, food, shelter, safe passage places to raise their young. One of the things that, that is important in that is water. And I'm glad that Tora brought that up as well. 
water is critical to, um, to life, right? And to the birds that we are trying to invite into our spaces. Um, and that could be for drinking or for bathing like this sharp shinned hawk is appeared to be um, doing here in this bird bath. So providing a water source is important. Um, if you have kind of this traditional deep uh, bird bath, that's fine for something like a Sharpie, but if you, but you should probably put rocks in it or something like that, which will allow smaller birds to understand the depth and not necessarily fall into the water. You don't need to have such a large bird bath. A small pan can, can function for that way just as well. And, um, but even putting pebbles in that can be helpful for birds to judge the depth of it and understand what they're getting into. So, um, but water is important. Um, okay, so I, I want to I, I want to talk about a couple things on the safe passage side of things, um, and one of those is cats. Um, so if we're thinking about how do we improve habitat and share habitat with birds, if we're inviting birds into our spaces, one of the things that I think that we don't want to do is then put them at risk by having predators. Um, in that introducing predators deliberately into that space. And one of the things that we understand is that um, domestic, free ranging domestic and feral cats actually pose a tremendous risk to our native wildlife. And our best understanding is that billions, that's with a B, of birds and other wildlife, small mammals, reptiles, et cetera, are killed by free ranging um, domestic and feral cats. And so if I can make one plug for safety, I'll make two plugs, but this is one plug I'm gonna make is um, keep your cats indoors. And that will help the birds that we're trying to attract and support with the plantings that we're doing. And then the other thing from a safety perspective is that um, we really wanna make our windows more visible to birds. Uh, and that is because glass can be very confusing for birds. It actually, they do not see it as a barrier. They see that reflection. This is actually my house right here. And you can see my neighbor's fence is pretty clearly reflected in that window and they'll crash into it. Um, after cats, collisions with the human built environment is, is probably the second direct lethal threat that birds face <laughs> in our environment. And so you can see what I've done here is there's a product called Feather Friendly, which is a tape that you put on your window, you peel the tape off and it leaves these small dots that are spaced about two inches apart. That is enough to give birds the understanding that this is actually a barrier and they won't fly into it. It's just one product and you don't even need to have a product. You can do things like put tempura paint on your window. You can do lots of things that will help them understand that that is a barrier. And again, I just want to, to reinforce that we want to, to provide habitat. We want to welcome birds into the spaces we share with them. But if we're doing that, we need to make those spaces safe as well. So while we're providing that food and that shelter, the places to place places to raise young for birds, we need to make them safe as well. So I have a lot more to share. I think we're gonna get to that in the questions, but I just wanted to share those aspects of it. And um, another photo that came in through our photo awards of here at Paraloxion and Ocotillo and um, I have lots more photos that came from them. I'm always looking for more. Oh my gosh, thank you, John. That, that was really amazing and informative and I'm jealous of those pictures, um, <laughs> but everyone has such beautiful pictures in this presentation. Um, so Maya's hopping over to our uh, questions. And so now we're gonna have our fun panel discussion. And so um, we've assembled these questions for our panelists. And again, we just wanna have a, a, a fun and informative conversation about ways that we can uh, maximize habitat and make our uh, gardens and the places we live more friendly to the wildlife that we share it with. So uh, the first question I have for everybody is, in your experience, um, what native plants, uh, and that can be a specific species or maybe a, a plant genus or a family, but what plants pack the most habitat punch? I guess I'll go since I'm I'll go of... first. That's okay. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Go, Tony. Go ahead, go ahead Tony. For me, and you even, you even, this might be your go to because you mentioned it earlier, but I just love the buckwheats. Buckwheat, because I mean, obviously, when it flowers, it's bringing in the butterflies, the bees. We have tarantula hawks around here that just love it. But even when the flowers dry out, 
and it looks like just brown, rusty, and there's nothing there. If you look at it closely, you'll find so much wildlife in there still. So all year around, it has wildlife there. Granted, a lot of it's small. That's, that's one of the reasons I love the macro photography, if you look at some of the photos. But if you look really closely at buckwheat all year round, it has something there. It's an ecosystem in itself. So I love that. I love that that's my I love, that's I, my love I love our buckwheat species. This I think this one is a and Anne Marie, maybe maybe you know, but I think it's Ote Mountain Lotus. Is that what Hassia crassifolia? <laughs> I'm, I'm testing my knowledge here. So much better than I could. <laughs> But yeah, um, Tori, you have some really good plant recommendations for bees, right? Right. Well, the facilias for sure. Um, you know, it's, but I want to, you know, jump on Tony's bandwagon there too, because, you know, it's, it's about planting masses of these things, really. That's how you get the biggest bang for your buck. Don't just put one buckwheat, one facilia, you know, um, facilias, there's annuals and perennials. Make sure you're covering them all and you'll make um, the nectar sources. But if you really want the most, the biggest bang for your buck, you have to get something that, you know, um, like you said, where you have, it's not just the nectar source for some species, but it's also the seeds are for the songbirds, the, you know, so see and note, this is another one of those where it creates nesting habitat also, even after it's flowering and, um, and, it, and it's, you know, see and note this, um, facilias, but the salvias in this state are phenomenal. Mm. So you, if you plant salvias, whether it's, you know, Sonomanensis all the way to Clevelandii or the Spathaceae, you know, for hummingbird sage, you, if you are into salvias, um, but the, dip, the, the trick is not to deadhead them. That's the hardest thing for me to get your urban gardens to stop doing is deadheading their plants and cutting the seed heads off so the songbirds don't get them because they want more flowers. So they think deadheading, but really let it go through its life cycle. Um, yeah, and, and the architecture of those of those seed heads can be so beautiful, especially with the salvia. Yeah, it's, it's learning to not over maintain your yard is really how you get, no matter what plant native plants you're planting, stop over manicuring your yard. Nature worked all by itself before we got involved. So really, you know, hands off, like on, let it go through its life cycle. You know, um, learning, that's what I talked about also the, the life cycle of the butterfly, you know, when you're pruning your salvias, if you have host plants, um, you probably have chrysalis on those big sturdy stems of salvias. And when you prune them to the ground, you're gonna be right, wiping out a generation of pollinators because you've pruned all the chrysalis off. Also the, um, if you have mallows, hair streaks drop to the ground um, as a caterpillar wrap themselves up in the leaves and wait out winter to come out. So if you're raking all your leaves, your maintenance, your maintenance principles really um, can cause much damage to wildlife. So it, just plant the plants, but also learn the life cycle of the pollinators and how you can just gently garden. That's really the trick. You know, um, it's sort of like what, you know, not pruning trees during nesting season, you know, um, prune the trees when it's not nesting season, <laughs> you know, those kind of habits, it's the habits, the maintenance habits of really how you maximize your plants. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks and for anybody else. have One, one other thing about the salvias, the sages, we have two sage gardens out, out back here by the nature trail, ditto everything Tora said, but then the scent, the smells that you get all year long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're, Incredible. and they're, and they're usually deer resistant. <laughs> that's another because it, it's a little too pungent for the deer so you know that's another little you know you have to know but a lot of people I get talks when I do talks they're, they're deer resistant is a big thing if they're out there and um but also you know their their structure is good for habitat I'm I don't know if John agrees but in the morning on the sages in our urban garden the titmouse and all they're all in there getting the seeds like before the people come and walk through the gardens. There's all these tiny little birds, songbirds that are using the sages in the morning. Yeah, definitely. Salvia was definitely one of the ones I was thinking about. And I'm glad, Tora, that you mentioned the, you know, don't deadhead because you get the salvias that can support hummers and stuff, but then you get the bush tits, you get the 
all of those that are the fin the finches that are feeding on the seed heads. So, um, and then one other one I was just thinking about from a resource perspective that I really love is Toyon. I um, mean the, mm. the the berries, the cedar wax wings, the mockingbirds. That you know they love it. It was I love that you showed that photo I sent you, David, of the scrub jay and the Toyon when you. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, no, no, not at all. No, I I, I love that. So uh, that's one of my favorites. Too. Yeah, amazing. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And, and you're all touching on some of these um, other points we're bringing up. I thought it'd be great, you know, may, maybe each of you can answer, you know, specifically, um, I mean, you all know so much, so it's not that you have to be limited to the to the wildlife that, that you're representing tonight on the talk, but, you know, let's, let's just answer for the audience, what are some of the direct and indirect ways that native plants support wildlife? I would say that um, a lot of the native plants are, uh, they get less pressure from non-native insects on native plants a lot. And, um, you know, um, the heavier, like the ornamental plants are usually where the non-native species are living a lot of times. I find out like, you know, with praying mantis and stuff, they're on the, they're looking for the, the more florifer floriferous plants. And they'll be hanging out waiting for butterflies. And it seems like the native plants that are, you know, sometimes you can get a better coverage for your native, for our um, pollinators versus that. That's sort of an indirect, that's just a small sliver. Um, but just if um, you, you tend to prune the non-native, the non-native, I mean, the native plants less. So you have habitat and, and shelter for them longer than you would those more ornamental plants where you're heavily maintaining them. So that's sort of an indirect way that people don't think about, but they need shelter as much as they need food. So, and I know that John talked a lot about that, but they need to hide out from predators. So I think that's an indirect way. Oh, thanks, Torpa. Yeah, and not only that shelter, but also like nesting material, uh, that's key. Uh, we have uh, dusky footed wood rats around here and you know, they take the twigs back and make their nests out in the coastal sage scrub and of course the birds and, uh, but it's key for things like that, shelter and protection. Yeah, definitely. John, I had a question about, it's kind of the last topic, but I was, I took a picture of a goldfinch eating aphids. Someone thought that was unique. Have you come across that at all? A goldfinch eating aphids off of milkweed plants and that might be obviously a plus for someone's garden. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to think of goldfinches as more um, seed eaters, but they will take animal protein as well. And certainly, you know, when you have those plants that they might be foraging around on, they're gonna take advantage of those sorts of additional protein sources as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just, I mean, we've talked about a couple, Tora and Tony brought up a couple of these things, you know, nesting material is 100% a thing. Milkweed obviously is something that can provide um, that sort of support. I, I just want to really make that, uh, and I alluded to it when, we, when I was talking about native plants, but there's the direct resources that we think about that they provide as well, but there's just, it's really critical that they're, the way that they are these fantastic insect hosts that are really critical to the full life cycle of, of the birds that we share the habitat with. And, you know, as an ornithologist, I, 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 um, I often very respectfully refer to caterpillars as, you know, bags of fat and protein because they are just, they're so incredibly important to our um, native birds. So that, I think of that as an indirect way um, that the, our native plants just do a much better job at supporting birds in our, in our communities. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, the kind of the trophic idea that, you know, the, the insects are eating the native plants, but then of course those go up the food chain and the birds, like you're, you said, John, even if a bird is not necessarily insectivorous or eats insects, it, it will feed those insects with young, depending on the species. Right. Beautiful. David, if I could yeah. know, a little bit about that one plant that's a big bang for your buck that I should have brought up and that the caterpillars reminded me of is um, oaks. Oaks are yeah, huge thanks. for pollinators. Thanks for bringing Also, me. if you think about, because they get like the tent caterpillars and they get, it's not just that they're apps like for the butterflies, a host plant, but they're important 
think about all the caterpillar, the oak caterpillars that we get. And if 75% of the food that songbirds feed their fledglings, that's a huge amount. And um, it's so important that people do not spray their oak trees when they get the 10 caterpillars. I mean, that's really a problem is that, you know, they freak out thinking it's going to defoliate the oak, but that oak will bounce right back, you know, but that's tons of don't pollute that food for the songbirds. Make sure you just let it go. Um, you know, we have that many times in city parks where they just get completely defoliated, but I just would watch the songbirds go nuts with all those caterpillars. So yeah. oaks, oaks is another one. Am I, am I allowed to plug someone's uh, book that's a great source uh, regarding this and native plants and Douglas Ptolemy? Doug Ptolemy. Doug Ptolemy. Yeah. Bringing Nature Home and some of his other books regarding right. especially the amount of caterpillars that birds need to survive and thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. I was going to say from Doug Ptolemy's research, I think I think he compared uh, native oaks and, to like ginkgo trees and essentially non-native trees and found that I think the oaks, you know, essentially supported over 200 different species of wildlife for say a non-native tree like a ginkgo was only supporting three of three to five. So there really is that direct correlation between the, the wildlife that co-evolved with these plants really rely on it in really, really fundamental ways. And plants that come from other parts of the world into California don't have that bond, uh, that ecological bond that the natives do. And so, you know, I've, I've heard it's like if, if there's any plant you can plant and if you have room for it. Oaks are, are just so, so important. There are scrub oaks, they're tiny, tinier, <laughs> not, not giant trees, but there are options if you don't have a uh, big space. Um, I, I I would, that, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say that the number of oaks, caterpillars that oaks host is 557 in the latest tabulation oh that God. Doug has done. So it's just, it, it is, and that is the, his message, right? If you're gonna plant one, one tree plant an oak. Yeah. Well, and it looks like we have a bunch of uh, devotees here watching, <laughs> watching the chat. <laughs> yeah. Question though, Everybody on, does when goldfinches skeletonize the leaves of plants, are they doing that for food or for nesting material? Uh, that's probably more for nesting material. Yeah, they aren't really folivorous. Folivory is not really a great um, strategy because it's not nutritious and most you know, organisms that need to digest that have to have symbiotic gut flora. So they're probably doing um, more of it for nesting material. Mm. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so for the, for the three of you, I just wanna ask, how do you personally observe and document wildlife in your garden? Um, I, I encourage people, and especially our volunteers to take a photo, but we also use iNaturalist a lot Mm -hmm. um, iNaturalist is a great way, um, but with pollinators, we do, you know, we work with Xerces and Monarch Joint Venture to do their mon milkweed mappers, and there's so many different ways. iNaturalist just seems to be the easiest, you know, it's an app on your phone, and you can create projects, um, um, take a photo of it. I know photographing pollinators are not always the easiest thing in the world, because they're pretty fast. Um, but I really, you know, it's photographs are everything. It's so easy to ID that way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, get a fast camera. That's my, my <laughs> fast camera, but also journaling. We encourage people to journal so that you see, um, for me, photography, because it keeps a date with it. So I saw when that, you know, that species was in my yard at what, you know, what month. Mm. And we tend to do both of those as well. We have the kids out in the gardens taking photos. Of course, everyone's got a camera nowadays, right? Or a phone, that's a camera, it seems. Uh, so they use that. But then the, the sketching too, the journaling, um, especially in the ecology unit, we, that's, a, that's a lost art. Just sitting down and, and drawing, yeah. labeling, things like that. So. We do that as well. And then we have the trail cams that I mentioned around. Tony, you have a bunch of fabulous photos. Do you have a recommendation for a good point and shoot? We have somebody asking. Well, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Um, st little story on that. Well, I, I personally use a Nikon. <laughs> One winter, I bought my son a package deal and it came with a couple lenses in it. 
um, just kind of the run of the mill. And it was such a good deal. I bought one for myself. So that's what I've been using. I did go out on Amazon and buy the least expensive telephoto lens I could find. So <laughs> uh, that's what I use. It is a Sigma. So I'll give a plug to Sigma. It's really heavy. So it's a good workout. Um, and then interestingly enough, some of the macro shots I've been taking lately is just a, a little, it was $40. My wife got it for me uh, for Christmas and you just clip it on your phone. I do have a macro lens, uh, an affordable one that I got um, for my big camera, the Nikon, but it's, it's just a little lens you click on your phone. It takes wonderful pictures. So if you guys have a chance to look at that Instagram and some of the macro shots, that was probably taken with the little clip on lens. Um, so thanks for the compliment, but it's a lot of trial and error. Um, and a lot of those pictures are with my big telephoto lens. Uh, it could be a, an insect, but it, it's also for the birding too. Um, Sigma lens, Nikon camera, 30, uh, D3400, I believe. Um, very entry level camera. So very affordable for those who are looking into that. Cool. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks. Olo Clip is the one I yeah. use on my iPhone. It's called Olo Clip, O L L O Clip. Um, that clips right on your. Um, some of my best macro shots actually came from my uh, Olo Clip on my iPhone. So um, I use yeah, it. The, Tony. My name is. Mine's. Uh, on the tip of my tongue, it's like Zeno or something like that, X-E-N-O. I could have that off by a letter, but I'm sure if you guys search that, you could find probably both of them. Yeah, there's so many out there now. Cool. Yeah. Did you, did you have something to say about the uh, documentation of wildlife? Me? Yeah. Oh, I sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think INAD is a great one. We I use probably not surprisingly eBird as well. That's one that I use to um, log observations. And I just wanted to also mention there's, um, I've been involved in a community science program here in Los Angeles that's run out of, um, Eric Wood is a professor at Cal State LA who is looking at um, plant uh, yards that have native plants in them and doing a comparison to look at how that's actually affecting pollinators, birds, et cetera. And so I um, during the pandemic, we were um, collecting data on our own yards here and they've, um, they've started taking up again, doing observations on that. So if there's anybody in the audience who's interested and has can contribute to that science, that would be really valuable. Um, his name is Eric Wood. He's a professor at um, Cal State LA. So if you reached out to him. So just thinking about observ observing and documenting how that can con contribute to our understanding more broadly about the, the benefits of native plants would be a value. Awesome, thank you. All right, we'll go on to the next question. We're running a little short on time, but um, so many great things to ask. Uh, um, Tori, you touched on you touched on this, and, and everyone did. John too about the about the ways you can uh, add things to your windows. But what are some garden features you can implement that just really add that habitat value to your yard and and make your yard more friendly to wildlife? Um, like you see in my in my slide, I had the seed fountain. Um, that's from Mariposa Garden and Designs in Berkeley. Um, it's slow moving and it's it's not made out of plastic. It's it's you know sandstone, so it's it's getting minerals. But another thing you can do is a puddling tray. Um, pollinators love um, poop, <laughs> so if you put mixed sand and and manure like compost um, and put it in a like a plant tray with pebbles, like um, John was saying where a sprinkler can hit it, or you can just keep it full of water, but it's very, very shallow. The male butterflies especially really will puddle in it because they need the minerals and the electrolytes. Um, that's why you see a lot of um, bird, uh, butterflies in dog parks, like where dogs have you know, urinated at the bottom of a pole, you'll see a little puddling, especially sulfurs, will put, like, there'll be like 30 of them just piled. Um, but they really need the minerals, not just the water. So that's the thing people don't talk about a lot is the puddling trays, but, you know, the rocks and the logs, all of that, um, they're all, you know, we think about it is we want to put it in our compost bins, but really leave some of those, um, the dead sticks and the logs and stuff for the native bees, but also the songbirds, you know, um, the seed heads, but 
the water feature, I think is the number one thing for me, slow moving, shallow um, water features. Beautiful. And I do know what uh, Tora said on the leaving the seed heads there um, and um, the water. We have, like I said, we have two ponds. One is seasonal. We let dry up uh, when it stops raining. And then the other one actually has a scout project. There's a buoyancy control. So that's our water source on the other side, the nature trail side of the school. So definitely water is key. And then we have uh, one of the popular scout projects are uh, birdhouses. So we have some excellent, excellent birdhouses around. Uh, so I highly recommend birdhouses as well. We've got uh, an incredible number of Western bluebirds around the school and little wrens that like to use them. And um, it's been a, an awesome addition to our habitat. Beautiful. Um, we have a great question from Alina. She asked, um, what should be the first steps in transforming your backyard into bird and butterfly sanctuaries? I think that's a great question. The first step, stop spraying pesticides. <laughs> you know, and then native plants. That's the first step, but you have to get, you have to have a separation of the two. If you've recently used pesticides and especially insecticides in your yard, don't plant native plants right away um, because they could still be uptaking it. And then the things that are attracted to your new native plants might be killed off by the pesticides you had in your yard. So that's really important is to not have those two collide I, I, John, you, you told me something, and I think Tori, you touched on it too, is like being okay with untidiness, like letting the leaf litter accumulate, let it in certain areas, and there's strategic ways to do that, but do you want to speak to that, John? Because I thought that was uh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about that. I mean, I, we, uh, Tony and Tori have talked a lot about, and I agree with all of that stuff. One thing that I was just going to share was that, that aspect of, so the vast majority of actually moth um, pupae, moth, moth caterpillars, when they pupate, they fall out of the tree onto the ground and complete their, um, their life cycle their, until they um, emerge either in the leaf litter or in the, in the soil. And so we, I like to give people permission to not, you know, mess with the leaf litter, leave it, right? Because that will, uh, birds forage in that, they'll fossick around in it and, and, you know, potentially find those pupae but will also allow those moth larvae to then complete their life cycle, which is obviously critical. So uh, definitely leave your seed heads on. Don't, don't you know, create a tidy garden, create a garden that's actually gonna be beneficial for wildlife and it will give you more free time back, right? I mean, what could be better? <laughs> All right, so we, we're running really close on time. Let's, uh, I still wanna ask these questions. Actually, I think this is the last one. So if everyone can keep their answer to maybe um, one minute, that's the challenge. Uh, but I'd love to ask you, do you have any tips for attracting specific wildlife? And you can quantify that however you want. If there's a specific species or a bird or pollinator, um, any tips for a very specific species? Um, oh, native bees are my favorite, you know. Um, and it's really important to have, like I said, the whole life cycle. So. Um, the, the solitary bees, people don't realize that the native bees don't sting. So leaving that either dead wood or getting one of those um, bee house, the native bee nesting blocks, but don't get them from hot Costco because there's, the problem is that ones that you buy commercially are made out of cedar and cedar has a natural insecticide. So it's sort of a really horrible idea. <laughs> get, you know, go to an, a, like to your um, songbird store or um, crown bees, buy, an, uh, buy a nesting block that's made specifically for your native bees um, or leave a log that's drilled with holes or dead wood. Um, don't till because the native bees are nesting in your soil um, and you're gonna kill off the whole generation of that year. Um, so plant a bunch of nectar, facilia, all of the, the nectar sources, but also be aware of their nesting sites. Um, if you see little um, holes in your soil, it's probably not just ants. They could be the native bees if you're planting a lot of native plants. Um, and you can tell when you have le those little, for leafcutter bees, those perfectly round leaves, the little hole like in your roses or 
whatever, that's how you know you have leaf cutter bees and then you really need dead wood. Um, and you'll see the holes plugged with that leaf matter in your dead wood. So you know that they're there. Um, you know, I think they need a lot more attention right now than they're getting, so. Uh, Tony, do you wanna go next? Okay. Okay, my, my um, go-to, quick go-to, are, I think I mentioned a couple times, are the diehard natives for us, the diehard natives. Of course, you would have to know what that is, especially if you have a little yard out in front type of thing. So I'm gonna make a plug for Calscape. Um, you know, using sources like that to find out what is the best plant for your area and, and, and go with those, those diehards if you wanna, cool. you know, a quick answer. Thanks, Tony, that was awesome. John? Um, yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with hummingbirds, and I'm gonna go um, uh, to to actually think about. Um, and this is something you and I talked about, David. Is like the phenology, like the sequence of plants that you're putting in your yard to provide nectar um, consistently, right? So, and the, and again, you know, you can find that kind of information on Scalescape, what the flowering cycles are, and everything. So you could actually think about that. So that would be my quick tip, right? Is that if you want to actually support, I, I mean, I like to think about this all the time, how we support full life cycle conservation of these species. So that would be something to think about carefully is if we can provide food, we're doing it consistently throughout the year and there's ways to do that. That's a great point. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much panelists. Uh, we'll just go to our closing slide here. And I think we have time for maybe just two questions, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I wanted to close out. Thanks, Tony, for bringing up Calscape. Everyone, if you have not already, it's such a great tool. You just put your zip code or even your address in and it will come back with a list of site native, regionally appropriate native plants. Uh, and uh, in addition, there's all these other features. One is it'll tell you what nurseries uh, carry those plants and are, are uh, close to you. Um, and then buy native plants. We have several chapters having plant sales right now. I'm up in the Sacramento uh, Valley and there's the annual sale uh, going on right now. So um, check those out and uh, check out our, our native plant nurseries across the state. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. We have time for just uh, two questions. Anne-Marie or Maya, do you wanna uh, pose those real quick? Well, we've got one on what is a good safe way to host monarch caterpillars and the chrysalis? Can they get hold of you for more information on that, Tora? Um, yeah, you know, it all depends on your area. So plant your native milkweed, um, but also a really good, you know, like lear learning the life cycle. Most monarchs will not go to um, chrysalis on their host plant. They'll crawl off um, and go onto something sturdy. Usually the bottom, like the fence or a tool shed or a big tree or shrub next to it. Um, so it's really important not to, that's like when I was talking about pruning, not pruning off the chrysalis. Um, we planted the milkweed, we had some um, showy milkweed in a garden that was next to a big pineapple sage. And when my staff wanted to prune the sage, I told them they had to look for chrysalis and we found 19 chrysalis on the sage next to the milkweed. Oh so um, make sure, but I do know that they really like strong s structures like fences and like um, the, the upper rail on your fence, if it's near your milkweed, look underneath it and you might see chrysalis. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to want to hide from the um, shelter, from wind and from predators. Um, so um, knowing, you know, having safe structure is a good way to do that. Um, don't spray for the aphids, leave the aphids. You can just wash them off with water. Um, just, you know, plant your native, you know, fascicularis, and showy are the two most common in the state. Um, but just plant more milkweed, everyone. We need it, the, the monarchs need you to do it. Like I said, make sure it doesn't, hasn't been sprayed with any kind of pesticide. So your local and CNPS nurseries will probably have pesticide free milkweed, but orchid seed. You can contact me, pollinatorposse.org. Um, and we will be gladly to connect you with somebody who might have some. Cool. I'm going to actually leave it at there just because we're out of time. But thank you, panelists, so much for joining us tonight. You were all so fabulous. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, we hope you uh, had a great time. So we'll see you hopefully next month on our Naturehood Gardening uh, webinar series. So good night, everybody.